Hello, everybody, and welcome into episode number 189 of the Bible 2021 podcast. We are reading Psalm 5 and Psalm 6 today, and our focus is on how we handle God's delays in answering our prayers and how we bring our grief to God. Well, we're daily podcasts where we're usually reading one chapter of the Word of God a day. When we read the Psalms, sometimes we're going to read a couple of Psalms a day. Five days a week, we're in the New Testament. Twice a week, we're in the Old Testament. Welcome aboard to new listeners in New South Wales, Australia, Parts Unknown, Nepal, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Uttar Pradesh, India, Fort Worth, Texas, Birmingham, Alabama, my hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Los Angeles, California. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for joining us. Do allow me to point you to our website, Bible2021.com. And if you want to subscribe to the show, boy, we'd sure appreciate it if you do that. And share us with your friends. You can do that through our website, Bible2021.com. 2021.com or just search on your favorite podcasting app for the Bible 2021 podcast. The original title of today's episode was How Honest Can We Be in Praying to God? And when you read Psalm 5 and 6, the answer is pretty obvious. We can be like really, really, really blatantly open and honest and transparent when we pray. Because, you know, it would seem that David holds absolutely nothing back in these psalms. And that's going to be a theme we're going to see more and more as we read through the psalms. So I guess that issue is somewhat settled for now. Let's talk about a deeper issue. Have you ever prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about something and God is yet to answer? So at our church gathering tonight, we had a time of prayer where we all prayed for many, many people by name, and I myself prayed for a friend named Rick to be saved that I've been praying for almost three decades for. That's a long time to pray for somebody and not see any obvious answer. Well, how about healing prayers, like personal healing prayer, like a problem you're having and you're praying for God to help you with it, or prayers for friends and family members. I think I've told you guys before that my wife and I have five kids, all or almost all of them, we're not 100% sure about one of the kids, All, almost all of them have asthma. And when they were kids, they would cough their heads off anytime they got sick, and it feels like they got sick like all the time. It was crazy. And I remember so many times going into the room to lay on the floor while they were trying to sleep or whatever, just to be close, just in case they had a need or something, and just praying and praying and praying for them. And uh, man, I, it was kind of rare to see God immediately answer those prayers. And maybe you've done that for your kids or your spouse or yourself. Has God always answered your prayers quickly? I suspect your answer to that question is no. I know my answer to that question is no. Now, there have been times, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I've seen God miraculously answer prayer, and sometimes even miraculously and quickly answer my prayers, but the majority of the time, answers to the deepest and most soul-wrenching prayers seem to tarry long in coming. That is not an unusual experience for the people of God, and it hasn't been an unusual experience for the people of God for thousands of years. Think of Abram and Sarai praying for a baby, or Joseph longing for his estranged family, or Hannah praying for a son, or the children of Israel being in slavery for hundreds of years and crying out for deliverance. And think of David tonight in Psalm 6, where he says in verse 2, Be gracious to me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord. My bones are shaking. My whole being is shaken with terror. And you, Lord, how long? Verse 4, turn, Lord, rescue me. I am weary from my groaning. With my tears, I dampen my bed and drench my couch every night. My eyes are swollen from grief. Well, those are the deep words of somebody who has cried out to God again and again and again. How long, O Lord? Now, the Psalms teach us directly how to pray in our grief. They give us words for our deepest feelings, and they help us to communicate them to God. You aren't the first person who has literally fallen asleep crying and praying to God for help. Thousands of years ago, King David did the very same thing night after night after night to the point where he could say that his tears drenched his couch and his bed. Many of you have been to a similar place like that before, and these psalms help us to express those deep groanings of our soul when we're in agony. Well, let's read both of them, and then we're going to hear from Spurgeon about how to 
apply the lessons from these psalms to our prayer lives. Psalm chapter 5, verse 1. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my sighing. Pay attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for I pray to you. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. For you not, are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. The boastful cannot stand in your sight. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who tell lies. The Lord abhors violent and treacherous people, but I enter your house by the abundance of your faithful love. I bow down towards your holy temple in reverential awe of you. Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my adversaries. Make your way straight before me. For there's nothing reliable in what they say. Destruction is within them. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongues. Punish them, God. Let them fall by their own schemes. Drive them out because of their many crimes, for they rebel against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them shout for joy forever. May you shelter them, and may those who love your name boast about you. For you, Lord, bless the righteous one. You surround him with a favor like a shield. Amen. Psalm chapter 6, verse 1. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Do not discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are shaking. My whole being is shaken with terror. And you, Lord, how long? Turn, Lord, rescue me. Save me because of your faithful love, for there's no remembrance of you in death. Who can thank you in shoal? I am weary from my groaning. With my tears I dampen my bed and drench my couch every night. My eyes are swollen from grief. They grow old because of all, all of my enemies. Depart from me, all evildoers, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and shake with terror. They will turn back and suddenly be disgraced. So how do these psalms help us when we are in the agony of our souls? Well, here's Charles Spurgeon on what we can learn about going through trials and troubles and praying through trials and troubles from David's agony here. Spurgeon says, David's bones were shaken, as the Hebrew says it. His terror had become so great that his very bones shook. Not only did his flesh quiver, but the bones, the solid pillars of the house of manhood, were made to tremble. My bones are shaken. When the soul has a sense of sin and trouble, it is enough to make the bones shake. It is enough to make a man's hair stand up on end to see the flames of hell beneath him, an angry God above him, and danger and doubt surrounding him. Well might he say, my bones are shaken. Lest, however, we should imagine that it was merely a bodily sickness, the psalmist goes on to say, my soul is also sore vexed or aggravated or troubled. Soul trouble is the very soul of trouble. It matters not that the bones shake if the soul is firm, but when the soul itself is also sorely troubled, that is agony indeed. But thou, O Lord, how long? That sentence ends abruptly, for words failed and grief drowned the little comfort which dawned upon him. The psalmist, though, still had some hope, but that hope was only in his God. He therefore cries, O oh Lord, how long? The coming of Christ into the soul in his robes of grace is the grand hope of the penitent soul, and indeed in some form or the other, Christ's appearance is and ever has been the hope of the saints. John Calvin's favorite exclamation was, Domine usque quo, O Lord, how long? Nor could his sharpest pains during a life of anguish force him from any other word. Surely this is the cry of the saints under the altar in the book of Revelation, O Lord, how long? And this should be the cry of the saints waiting for the millennial glories of God. Why are his chariots so long in coming? Lord, how long? Those of us who have passed through conviction of sin knew what it was to count our minutes, our hours, and our hours, years, while mercy delayed its coming. We watched for the dawn of grace as they watched for the morning. Earnestly did our anxious spirits ask, O oh Lord, how long? As God's absence was the main cause of his misery, so God's return would be enough to deliver David from his trouble. Oh, save me for the, your mercy's sake, he says. That means he knows where to look and what arm to lay hold upon. He doesn't lay hold on God's left hand of justice, but on his right hand of mercy. He knew his sin too well to think of merit or appeal to anything but the grace of God. 
for thy mercy's sake. What a plea that is that David makes. How prevalent it is with God. If we turn to justice, what plea can we urge? But if we turn to mercy, we may still cry, notwithstanding the greatness of our guilt, save me, O Lord, for your mercy's sake. Observe how frequently here David pleads the name of Yahweh, which is always intended where the word L-O-R-D is given in capitals. Five times in four verses, we here meet with it. Is it not a proof that the glorious name of God is full of consolation to the tempted and troubled saint? Eternity, infinity, infinity, immutability, self-existence are all in the name of Yahweh and are all full of comfort. Amen. Well, friends, let me encourage you to read these Psalms again. And if they express where your heart is right now in your life and your relationship with God, allow me to encourage you to read them out as a prayer and let them be imprinted on your heart. That's one of the greatest things about the Psalms for me. It helps me to communicate my emotions and my feelings in the deepest, darkest of places. And somehow, some way, I am so comforted when I read those Psalms, even a Psalm like today where it's gut-wrenching. It's still good. It's still comforting. It's still the Word of God. Well, let's close with our Bible memory verse for the month of July. It is Luke 6, 47 through 48. Jesus says, I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. Amen. Good day, friends, and Godspeed to you.